Good morning, church family. Let's do this one more time. Good morning, church family. Thank you for joining us in person, and thank you for joining us online. I am so glad that we are worshiping together today. If you are worshiping online with us, please say hello in the chat so I can see who's here today. I just dropped my hello in right now. So this today, after worship, you're invited to join us for either of our two Lent classes. In um, the first Lent class, your opportunity is an exploration of Jesus' contemplative contemplative practice and its intersections with new brain science. Practice the pause meets today in room 302. Or you are invited to join us for our second adult education class. This is What Is series starts um, with a discussion about implicit bias and it helps you to know yourself and your church and your family. This group is a drop-in friendly class and requires no preparation. Today's specific focus is systematic racism. Both groups are also offered virtually. If you'd like to join us online, please visit Church Center for the Zoom link. United Methodists from around Michigan are organizing for the first annual Advocacy Day at Central UMC in Lansing on March 22. This will be a day of prayer, public witness, and meetings with your elected officials at the Capitol about gun safety. There are three virtual training sessions leading up to this day. The first training session is this Tuesday. Go to grfumc.org news for details and to register. Thank you for supporting First Church and its mission work through your time, talents, and gifts. To give online, visit the Church Center app or go to grfumc.org give. For those of you in person, donation stations are available at both entrances to the sanctuary. Before we move to today's ministry focus, I want to extend the love and the prayers of the congregation to Ruth Chisnell and family on the death of her husband, Don, on February 28. Don's memorial service will be held on April 1 at 11 a.m. We hold your family in our prayers as we continue in worship and as we move to our ministry focus. Now I'd like to invite Lori Myskowski to share. Good morning, friends. I'm excited to be serving as the chair of the Building Connections Capital Campaign that will fund a major church renovation. The renovation will update the entire north entry of the area of our building that way focusing on welcoming, accessibility, community building, and outreach. In the month of March, we'll focus on information. So you'll be receiving campaign updates and fact sheets in the mail and online, and an invitation to attend some informational presentations on the last two Sundays in March. One of my favorite, very favorite things about being a United Methodist, I know you all have very favorite things about being a United Methodist, right? One of mine is John Wesley's understanding of grace in three stages. He used the metaphor of a house to describe our spiritual journey, and the first stage, prevenient grace, is the grace of the front porch. Imagine God inviting us in, maybe even before we know who God is. I used to drive by a house every day on my way to work, and it had this huge, wide front porch. It was deep and wide, and it was filled with flowers and wicker furniture. And it was so comfortable looking and welcoming that I wanted to knock on the door and ask if I could come in their house. I didn't. (laughs) But I suspect the people that live there would have said, come on in, because that's what their house looked like. And that's what God's invitation to us is like. Come see. Come on in. I was driving by our church one day with a friend who was working very hard to move her family out of poverty. And I pointed at the church and said, that's my church. And she said something that I could never forget. She said, it looks like a castle. 
I don't think people like me would be welcome there. Hmm. I wanted to be defensive, but I wasn't. I had to stop and think about that. So I love this church, but it does kind of look like a fortress with a moat around it, right, from the outside. How might we appear more welcoming? We've added flags to our building, and we've added a garden in the parking lot. But I fear our building still doesn't say, come on in. You're welcome here. So the building connections construction will add a welcoming feel to our church building and make the building ADA accessible to our community. The capital campaign invites you to come with us as we journey together. We're thankful for your questions, your participation, and your prayers as we move forward. Come on up to the porch. Come on in. I invite you to join responsibly in our call to worship. God of wisdom, let your word fall upon us this day. Let your law of love embed itself in our hearts. Let your grace and mercy take root in our lives. Open our hearts to your nurture that we may grow in faith. Open our lives to your guidance that we may grow in service. Send your Holy Spirit upon us that we may become true disciples of Jesus Christ.
standing as we pray together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, you delight in showing us your kingdom, a place of blessing, a place of light, a place of spirit and truth. May we be born anew in your spirit, that we might see the glory you have in store for us and for the world. For you sent your Son into our world, not to condemn us or put us to shame, but that we might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Please be seated. Hear then these words from the 121st Psalm. I raise my eyes toward the mountains. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God won't let your foot slip. Your protector won't fall asleep on the job. No. Israel's protector never sleeps or rests. The Lord is your protector. The Lord is your shade right beside you. The sun won't strike you during the day, neither will the moon at night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. God will protect your very life. The Lord will protect you on your journeys, whether going or coming. From now until forever from now. This is the word of God for the people of God. And now any children out there are welcome to come forward for our children's moment. Good morning, friends. I'm so glad to see you here today. Thanks for being here. Last week, in our children's moment, we talked a little bit about prayer, right? We talked about what it might look like to pray, what it might sound like to pray, rather. But today, I wondered if you would entertain an exercise in what it might look like and feel like to be in an attitude of prayer. Hmm? Will that be okay? All right. So this might be a little different than you when, than you think, but let me let me just take a poll here. If you're going to get ready to pray, show me what you look like. Go ahead, show me right now. Some of us are very still. I like it. Some of us have our eyes closed. Our hands are quiet. Yeah, that's absolutely one way to, play, to pray. Can I, do you have a different way to pray? Does anybody have a different one? No? Are you thinking, why is she asking me if there's another way to pray? All right, let's do a little stand-up time. All right. Let's shake our wiggles out. You ready? <laughs> Did you know you can pray like that? You can. You can pray while you're getting your wiggles out. Let's do some jumping. Come on, jump higher than me. What? Can you pray like that? You can. All right, last one. Let's jump and shout. Thank you, God. Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, God. Amen, friends. Let's have a seat. 
Friends, there are so many ways to pray. The only thing you need to remember when you're praying is that you are speaking to God and that God is listening. Yeah, listening. Friends, if you are in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, or second grade, and would like to come up to children and worship today, you may follow those boys. If you are in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, or sixth grade, and would like to head to children's choir, you may head out that door too. And parents, we're doing a science lesson in Sunday school after worship today, so you can pick up your kiddos after church or after Sunday school. Good morning, church. In case you do not know me and you're here for the first time or worshiping with us online for the first time, I'm Steve McCoy, senior pastor, and we are continuing our series called From Prayer to Connection. And today, we have a great example of a person who is coming and seeking a connection with Jesus. 
while at the same time trying to reconcile what it is that they think that they know along with what it is that they are feeling in their encounter with him. So let us hear now the reading from the Gospel of John from the third chapter, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water in the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, as we have listened to the words of your scripture, may now the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, who is our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The season of Lent has a couple of overarching themes that one can draw on throughout. But one of the biggest themes that we emphasize year after year is the contrast between the darkness and the light. In fact, the very word Lent itself means the lengthening of the days where we get more daylight as we head into spring. It's a universal theme also that we see in the world as well as in part of the scriptures that usually pits those two, light and darkness, as the forces of evil versus the forces of good. The forces of darkness are evil, of course. The forces of light are the good. Hence, we get what we have in Star Wars of the dark side and the light side of the force. The struggle between good, the struggle between evil. But the scriptures, while admittedly do use the darkness and light as a depiction of good and evil in some places, particularly in the Old Testament, Jesus here in this encounter with Nicodemus is giving us a different take or understanding of light and darkness. Not about good and evil. Rather, light and darkness are about revelation. In the darkness, it's easier to hide. And particularly, it's easier for us to conceal what we don't want others to see, or for that matter, what we ourselves may not want to see. The things of this world that we don't want to acknowledge or that we don't want to reveal. 
Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, however, is very revealing. Now, it's obvious to anyone that Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, is curious about Jesus and he wants to know more. But it is the things that he thinks he knows that are impeding him from seeing the full truth of what Jesus is doing. Now, the fact that a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, is curious about Jesus, who is redefining the law, is actually a very good first step for him. But Nicodemus, notice, still wants to be hidden. Nicodemus wants to hide his curiosity from the people whom he is associated with who think that they know everything already. And so, in hiding that, he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, in the darkness. Not because he is evil, but because of what he doesn't want others to see. There's also a deeper symbolism here, too, about the darkness, in that Nicodemus does not want to see for himself what he already has suspected in his heart. The truth that I believe Nicodemus is saying to himself in his head may not actually be true. This is what I was taught, and this is what I had learned, and yet this is also what I know and teach, but there was always something that's missing. And along comes Jesus, who is revealing something new. And from all evidence, he admits through Jesus' signs and wonders, that this is true. Yet others, like the Pharisees, of whom Nicodemus is associated with, just plain won't accept it. And Nicodemus, though he accepts it, does not want to see it. And so he chooses to stay hidden in the dark. Yet even under the cover of darkness, we must acknowledge that he still comes seeking, trying to find Jesus. But what he is seeking is not answers, initially at least. What he is seeking is validation for what he already believes about God. And he wants Jesus to affirm that for him. Yet Jesus' answer is one that only further confounds him. You cannot see kingdom of God without being born from above. Now the word that Jesus uses here in the context, the Greek word that is, is called anothen, which can have actually two meanings depending on how you use it. One meaning is to be born again, or to more accurately state it, to be reborn. The other meaning, as we have translated it here in our scriptures, is to be born from above. And yet Nicodemus, being the literal Pharisee that he is, chooses the former use and asks, well then how can that actually happen? Come on now. But again, he chooses not to see what Jesus is revealing and to stay in the dark, clinging to what he thinks he already knows. Jesus reveals more that the kingdom of God is not about what you are born into, but uh, what are you willing to let go of, to have that new birth, not in the physical sense, but of the spirit, which blows where it will. We can see the signs, and we can choose to follow, or we can remain in the dark clinging to what we have believed to be true while the reality of God's creation blows all around us. And so incredulously, Nicodemus asked, how can this be? And this is where Jesus shines the light, so to speak, on Nicodemus. When he, even though you're not supposed to answer a question with another question, Jesus pointedly puts it back to him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? If you don't understand what God is doing through me and the Spirit on earth, how can you possibly understand the things of heaven? The thing is, 
Nicodemus already knows the answer to the question. He just won't see it. Because his entire world then will be turned upside down. And that is what Jesus has actually come to do. Reverend Susan Gray shared her experience of this type of encounter and this line of thinking that is still present in many Christian circles today, where she said that when I was in college, I once had a classmate follow me down the street repeatedly asking, but have you been born again? Now, at the age of 19, I wasn't sure what answer he wanted from me, so I simply turned and said, I've been baptized. Yet he kept pursuit with the same voice of fear questioning me. She said, I knew my soul was at peace with God. I wasn't so sure about my classmates. One of the gifts of the season of Lent is that we move from darkness to light. It reveals those things about ourselves and our world that are true. We cannot hide them as much as we try. Because all will be revealed eventually. And that is part of why we practice what we do in Lent. Prayer. Fasting. Self-denial. Not out of a sense that if we do all these things, then after 40 days we're going to be okay with God again by checking a box. We follow these disciplines. So that through our prayer and through our discipline, we will see for ourselves what we already know to be true. That we have the gifts. That we have the ability to understand them. Because God is at work, not just now, but God is at work always in our lives. God is at work in us and in the Spirit and there is a yearning, like Nicodemus had, that is deep inside all of our souls to believe this. Yet oftentimes, the choices that we make don't reflect that light. Years ago, when I was serving on a local board while at a previous church, people were discussing what it is that they were going to be doing uh, for spring break before the meeting got started with their families. And one person had shared that they were going on a cruise with their family and they were quite looking forward to it. And another person said, wait, you're going on a cruise? Thought you gave up alcohol for Lent. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but the cruise is a Lent-free zone. <laughs> we all had a small laugh about that, just like you did here. And then we moved on to other things. I think we eventually got the meeting started, too. But that rationalization stuck with me. Now, listen, I'm not here to judge somebody for that. If you want to have a few drinks on vacation, then have a few drinks. God bless you. But in the same vein, what he stated reveals the misunderstanding of what Lent is meant to accomplish. It is leading us through our prayer, through our fasting and our self-denial towards connecting deeper with God and deeper with the world. But if we are simply denying something, like I said earlier, to check a box, then we miss the point. The point, then, is how are these disciplines making us deeper followers of Jesus? How is it opening us up to more possibilities of how God is at work in our lives and how God is at work in the world and how we can imagine doing things differently than we can do on our own? If we cannot connect these things together, then how can we connect with others who are struggling along the way and show them that there is actually a new way a different way than the one that they have been taught or the way that we think that we know. The Pharisees of Jesus' day were all about rules. They were all about interpretation of those rules. That is why they and Jesus were at odds most of the time. Because Jesus didn't follow their rules. 
Jesus sits and eats with tax collectors and those deemed to be sinners. That's against the rules. Not that they cannot be redeemed, but they must first do so, or get right with God, if you will, before they can eat with you. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Again, that's against the rules. That's technically work. And there are six other days to heal, so heal on those days, not on the Sabbath. Not today. But Jesus heals because of what the Sabbath is truly for. Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman, forgives unforgivable sins, and yet, as Jesus says, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. It's out in the open. It is in the light for everyone to be able to see, and yet you still choose to hide in the dark. The season of Lent calls us to believe what Jesus says and what we might see on those bumper stickers or the signs and the arenas or the stadiums or on t-shirts that God so loved the world that God gave us Jesus and that Jesus is not here to condemn it as some would believe, but Jesus is here to redeem it. But yet we sometimes choose not to see that either. The fear in the voice and in the eyes of that college friend of Dr. Gray, if she had been born again, is a fear born out of his own sense of being condemned and unlovable by God unless he did something about it rather than acknowledging that God has already done something about it and he need not be afraid. Rationalization of my fellow board member speaks to the deeper rationalization that if I follow all the rules and ask for an exemption for one because I do all the other ones the other time, it's going to be okay. It's really about our inability to understand that it's not that act of sacrifice itself that is important, but the spirit in which we do so and how the spirit transforms our souls into being born from above. Even in asking the question. It assumes that the process of rebirth in the spirit is something that happens once, and if you can't tell me when it is and don't know the name, date, place, or time, then it didn't really happen, and therefore you're not saved. Yet Jesus tells Nicodemus, tells us, that the spirit blows where it will. We don't see it, but we can feel it. And it is always, always on the move. For those who are born of the Spirit, we can be willing to let it lead us to light, more light, brighter light, so that we can see not only for ourselves, but we can also see where the Spirit has been and where we are being led. This is actually what we know. It's what's revealed to us in Lent more deeply, but it is made real for us in Jesus in life and in his death and in resurrection of which we all live. It's revealed to us not out of anger or out of guilt, but it's revealed to us out of love. Love that comes forth from God first and invites us to follow out of that darkness of our own spirit and into the light that God reveals through the Spirit to the whole world. Through our time of prayer, through our time of fasting, through our time of self-denial, may that light be revealed to us and what we know to be true. And may we connect then with God's world and God's Spirit in new ways that leads others to new light and life in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, as we gather together now around this table that has been given to us, I want to remind everyone here that it is Christ our Lord who invites to the table all who love him and all who seek to live in communion with God through the Spirit in Christ Jesus himself. Whether you are a member of this congregation or not, whether you're a member of the United Methodist Church or not, or whether you're a member of any church or not, it is Christ who bids you to come and to partake in this feast of grace, this feast of forgiveness, and this feast of love. And so in that spirit, let us join our voices responsibly in this great thanksgiving. May the living God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We delight in your word and in bringing praise and sacrifice to you, holy triune God, who calls us during these 40 days to turn our hearts to the right, to live in your grace and to be reconciled to one another as you have reconciled us. As we have been created in your image, you call us to new life and to new hope. Just as Nicodemus sought out life and hope in the signs and wonders of Jesus, so too do we seek to be a sign and to be born anew through your loving spirit. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Jesus, we gather at this table, remembering all you have given us. We remember Jesus' healing touch, his strong compassion, his righteous anger, and his prayerful strength. We remember how he gathered your people, stranger and friend alike, gave thanks to you for them, offered them the bread of life and the cup of freedom and proclaimed a new covenant in your name. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered at the table with his disciples and shared in the feast. When the feast was over, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take this and eat. For this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the feast was finished, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as do this in remembrance of me. And now as we continue this great journey of Lent, remembering the wonder of his life, the agony of his death, and the joy of his resurrection, we unite with all the saints, proclaiming the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, loving God, and upon these gifts of the bread and the fruit of the vine, that in eating and drinking together we may be truly transformed and strengthened in our commitment to your call to do justice, celebrate creation, and honor the human differences through which your love shines. Bless our communion with strength and purpose, we pray, and make us one in love, through the power of your risen Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
Now, with the confidence of children of God, let us say together the prayer that Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In just a moment, you'll be invited to come through the aisle in the pews at either one of our serving stations here to receive a piece of bread and also to receive a cup. Once you have done that, we invite you to return back to your seat and to offer yourself in a time of prayer if you feel so moved. I'll be serving those who are assisting us today, and then all will be invited to come.
Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which your grace and love is revealed to us once again. Grant now that we might go from this place sharing in the light of your love, sharing in the truth of your grace, and sharing in the knowledge of the spirit that lives within us and guides us in all of our days. Amen. Now may the God of grace that reveals in light and in love what it is that we already know. We know that God so loved the world and therefore God so loved us. Let us go now into the world and share in that light and that love with all who would hear. 